These words were spoken by Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963. He said this. He said, one of the great tragedies of life is that men seldom bridge the gulf between practice and profession, between doing and saying. A persistent schizophrenia leaves so many of us tragically divided against ourselves. On the one hand, we proudly profess certain sublime and noble principles, but on the other hand, we sadly practice the very antithesis of these principles. How often are our lives characterized by, by high blood pressure of creeds and an anemia of deeds? We talk eloquently about our commitment to the principles of Christianity, and yet our lives are saturated with the practices of paganism. We proclaim our devotion to democracy, but we sadly practice the very opposite of the democratic creed. We talk passionately about peace, and at the same time, we assiduously prepare for war. We make our fervent pleas, for the, fervent pleas for the high road of justice, and then we tread unflinchingly the low road of injustice. And here is how he ends, and I love this. This strange dichotomy, this agonizing gulf between the ought and the is, represents the tragic themes of man's earthly pilgrimage. Those words spoken by Martin Luther King Jr. 60 years ago still ring true today, maybe more than ever before. Today we're in part two of this five-week series in which we're talking about something we expect from everyone else, something we hold everyone else accountable to, our leaders, pastors, teachers, employees, employers, friends, kids, spouse, fiance, boyfriend, girlfriend, but something we're also quick to make excuses about, the lack of it in our own lives, and that something is integrity. And there's many different ways to define integrity, but the definition kind of using throughout this series is integrity is doing what you ought to, even if it costs you. And integrity is the resolve and the courage to do the right thing you know you and you feel you ought to do when it costs you to do so just because it's the right thing to do. As we talked about last week, integrity, it begins with an ought to. And we've all felt that internal conviction prompting stirring of I ought to. I just, I ought to. We've all felt it before. We, we've all felt that we, we ought not lie Cheat, steal. I mean, we never discussed the pros and cons with each other of lying and cheating and stealing. We just assume everyone knows it's wrong. These, what I call universal ought tos, that are, are, are universal ought tos everyone feels and we expect from everyone else. But we've also felt those internal convictions and promptings and stirrings and feelings of ought to that are specific and that are unique to us and, and, that, and that don't seem to be of ourselves. It's, I don't know why, but I just feel like I ought to. I ought to do that, give, their, give, give to them, go there, forgive them, talk to them, remove myself. I, I don't know why, but I, I feel like I, I just ought to sign up for that, break up with them, start doing this, stop doing that. I feel like I, I ought to come clean, accept that offer. Apologize to them. See a counselor. Work on my marriage. I mean, we've all felt the internal stirrings and promptings and feelings of ought to sexually, financially, relationally, at work, at home, at school. And if you took the time to think about it, you'll, you'll discover that you felt, you felt it numerous times and sometimes numerous times daily. These ought to's, they're inescapable. The question is, where do those ought to's come from? Well, according to Jesus, who... I think he would know better than you or me. According to Jesus, they don't come from our subconscious, the universe, our upbringing, within ourselves, by chance. According to Jesus, these feelings of ought to, these promptings, these stirrings that don't seem to be of ourselves come from God himself. Now, if you missed last week, I'd encourage you to go back and watch last week's message because 
you know, it sets the groundwork and the foundation for everything we're talking about the rest of the series, and I don't have time to review everything, obviously, but last week we discovered the feeling of ought to points to someone outside of you who is working in you to lead you. The internal conviction, prompting, stirring, feeling of, I ought to do that. That some don't seem to be of ourselves because it seems hard, sometimes it seems inconvenient, uncomfortable, sometimes it seems completely irrational, many times it seems sacrificial. That, that feeling of ought to points to someone outside of you, someone who's bigger than you and over you, God himself, who is working in you through his spirit, the, the, who we refer to as the Holy Spirit, to lead you. To lead you to himself, to lead you to what's best for you, your family, your kids, your marriage, your relationships, the people around you, to lead you to follow Jesus, to lead you to what will glorify God, to lead you to what Jesus would have you do sexually, financially, relationally, in your marriage, for your health, at work, at home, at school, in this situation, with that temptation, in this season of life, to lead you to true joy, true peace, true life, true hope, true fulfillment, true healing. Now, if Jesus' words are true, what that means is that the moment we feel an ought to that seems outside of you, but that's pressing down on you and your conscience, you've encountered God. You've encountered the divine. You've encountered the Holy Spirit. You've encountered the God who is for you, the God who loves you, the God who wants what's best for you and your future and your family and your kids and your marriage and the people around you, the God who is trying to lead you to himself. You've encountered the Holy Spirit speaking to you, leading you, guiding you into all that is true and all that is right according to God, into all that's true and all that's right for you in this situation as you navigate through the lives of this world, in your marriage, when you're trying to make a decision, when you're facing a, in, in the midst of a temptation, and when opportunities present, present themselves to you. And what that also means is that true integrity, true integrity is not anchored in or defined by our opinions or our preferences or our standards. True, true integrity is anchored in and defined by a God who is outside of you but is working in you to lead you. Being a person of integrity is the resolve and the courage to do the right thing you feel and you know you ought to do. And even if you don't believe those ought to's that you feel are from God, if you think it's just a little bit weird and strange, and I get it if you conclude that, it is weird and it is strange. Even if you don't believe these ought to's that you have felt and feel are from God, listen, you still want to be a person of integrity. And you want to be a person of integrity because as integrity goes, so goes everything. As your integrity goes, so goes your reputation, your future, respect you have from others, your well-being. But your integrity or lack of integrity is never isolated to just you. It impacts everything and everyone around you. As your integrity goes, so goes the health and strength of your family, your relationships, your marriage, your company, your team. We're going to be talking more about that today. But here's the deal. Your integrity is a really big deal. Not just for you, but for everyone around you, which is why we're taking a few weeks to talk about it. Now, before I launch into what we're getting into today, I want to ask you a question. And when I ask this question, I don't want anyone to raise their hand or like elbow the person next to you because here's the deal. I already know the answer to this question is yes, so you don't need to raise your hand. I know the answer is yes. So here's the question. Have you ever lied, you know, about why you were late, where you were, who you were with, why you missed a deadline in an attempt to assure someone, you know, your boss, your parents, your spouse, your kid, your coach, that you could be trusted? And the answer for all of us is yes. And isn't that, a, according to Martin Luther King Jr., a really strange dichotomy? I mean, the crazy thing about this is, is it starts with us when we're young. I did it with my parents, and my kids have done it with me. Now, my, both of my daughters are, are in high school now. Both of them are teenagers in high school. And, uh, but we've always had a rule, and it's still a rule today, but we've always had a rule at nighttime they can't keep their phones in their room. They've got to plug them in somewhere else in the house. And when they were a lot younger, they had to plug them in in our room. But they just can't plug them in in their room. They've got to plug them in somewhere else. Well, um, a few years ago, one of my daughters, I don't want to say which one because I don't want to embarrass her, but her name starts with an R, ends with an E, has East in the middle. Uh, <laughs> 
this was a few years ago, she, she uh, asked, she goes, it was a weekend, she said, hey, mom and dad, can I just keep my phone in my room so I can listen to music as I go to bed? And it was a weekend, we're like, yes, you can, but listen, don't be on your phone. She goes, you can trust me. All right. So anyway, about 30 minutes later, I went in to check on her, you know, to see if she was asleep, turn off her phone if it was still on, and the second I opened the door, the blanket went over the head. I mean, the second I opened the door. Now, I knew what she was doing, but I played stupid for the benefit of giving her some opportunity. I said, honey, are you okay? Yeah. What are you doing? Nothing. (laughs) Honey, are you on your phone? Now, in that moment, she had a decision to make. Do I want my dad to trust me or do I want to tell him the truth? Isn't that crazy? So she chose the lie. She said no so that I would trust her with her phone. I mean, how ironic is that? I mean, we all did this with our parents when we were young, but it didn't stop there, did it? Didn't for me at least, and I'm assuming it didn't with you either. In my late teens, early 20s, I was really hooked on pornography. And I thought, man, when I get married, when I get married, that'll all go away. That'll just all magically stop. But it didn't. Now, Christy, I've known Christy, my wife, since I was 14 years old. And so she knew about my past, and I had shirt her when we got married. You could trust me. I won't look at that stuff anymore. You can trust me. But that wasn't the case. And one night, Christy went to bed before I did, and I was like, I'm, I'm going to get on and look at the computer, look at pornography. And so I got on my desktop, because this is before laptops, and I dialed in, do-do, 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 to the internet, because it was, you know, this is before, like, you know, high-speed Wi-Fi, still to dial in. And I'm sitting there looking at pornography in my living room, and out of the corner of my eye, I see Christy walk into the room. And I'm frantically doing everything to, like, get it shut off before she sees what I'm looking at, and she goes, what are you doing? Nothing. You're looking at pornography? Now, in that moment, I had to decide if I wanted her to trust me or if I wanted to tell her the truth. So I lied and said no so that she would continue to trust me. I mean, it's the ultimate irony that we actually do this, and we've all done it. So let me ask you the same question in a different way. Have you ever compromised your integrity to protect your reputation as someone who has integrity? We all have. Most of us live with this pressure somewhere in our lives. I know, I do, I live it with you. I want you to trust me and I want you to respect me. No one wants to be part of a church where the pastor's the hypocrite and you hear me doing all these crazy things and then you're like, we should probably not go there and pray for his wife. You know, like no one wants to be part of a church like that. And so when I do something, when I mess up or something that can discredit, you know, myself and, you know, losing your trust and your, your respect, I'm tempted to lie and I'm tempted to cover up in order to maintain your trust and your respect. We all feel that. We all live with this pressure and if we're being honest, we would rather do what we ought not to do than look bad. And we'd rather to because of the pressure that we feel. And you know this, the external pressure, the external pressure to compromise rather than, uh, rather than preserve our integrity, it's relentless. We, we feel the external pressure to compromise what we ought to do because honestly in some fields and in some industries, it, it, it seems like it's the only way to get ahead, to stay ahead, to beat the competition. You've probably felt this external pressure from your boss, your employees, maybe your coach, your coworkers, your teammates, your friends, your parents, that if you don't compromise, you know, you're ought to, just a little, just for a moment, You're going to be left behind, looked over, abandoned, left out, and lose. So the external pressure, it's relentless. But maybe even more disturbing, the internal, the internal pressure to compromise rather than preserve our integrity is relentless as well. The internal pressure of shame avoidance and failure avoidance, it's very strong in all of us. None of us want to look bad. None of us want to be shamed, be ashamed, be embarrassed, and fail. Man, when it comes to maintaining our integrity, the deck is stacked against us because the external pressure and internal pressure to compromise is so, so strong. So, good luck, God bless, let's pray, and let's go home. Now, there's a way forward. There is a way forward, but to be honest, it's 100% up to you to decide. 
No one can decide this for you. There's a way to maintain your integrity by doing what you ought to do when you feel the external and internal pressure to compromise. And the way forward is to decide to embrace a big North Star idea. And this North Star idea is found in several places in Scripture, but the one we're going to look at that's the most direct is found in the Hebrew Scriptures that we call the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs. Now, most of the book of Proverbs, if not all the book of Proverbs, was written by King Solomon. King Solomon was an Israelite king who lived about a thousand years or so before, before the events of Jesus' life. And at the time he lived, he was recognized as the wisest man to have ever lived. We're going to look at one verse in Proverbs in which Solomon states this North Star idea. It's Proverbs 11.3. And I actually introduced you to this proverb last week, but we're going to walk through the whole thing today. And just before I get into this, I want to say, I encourage you, I challenge you to commit this verse to memory. Commit this verse to memory. Now, last week, you know, we put together this series lock screen and gave it to you last week and said, hey, put that on, on your phone so you can see it every single time. It has this verse on it. And if you didn't get it, that's okay. When you walk out of here, you're gonna, everyone's going to get a card today with this verse on it. Put this card somewhere where you can see it every single day, maybe multiple times a day, and commit this verse to memory because it's the way forward. Here's the way forward according to Solomon. The, here's our word, Integrity of the upright guides them or will guide them. It can be translated either way. In other words, for people of integrity, integrity is their guide, their north star, their decision-making filtered. It leads them, it directs them, it informs their, it informs their decisions, their choices, it informs their feet. It's through the filter through which they decide what options are appropriate and which options aren't. It's the filter through which they decide what to do and what not to do. It's the filter through which they decide how to respond when they feel that internal or external pressure to compromise. Now, here's an uncomfortable question you may not know the answer to, but we all need to know the answer to. And the question is, is what guides you? What guides your feet, your decisions? Your choices, because something does. What's your north star? Because something is. Is it doing the right thing you know and you feel you ought to do? Or is it pleasure? Money? Looking good? Not being left out? Status? Reputation? Security? Fear? Him? Her? Or something else. Many of us would say integrity is what guides us, but here's the challenge. You don't know if integrity guides you until maintaining it costs you. We don't know if integrity actually guides us until main, maintaining our integrity costs us. And what I'm going to say next sounds terrible, but I really do hope this for you. I hope that all of us at some point in time in the near future will have our integrity so tested. And it's more like a pop quiz, really, because you can't really prepare for this like a test. It's like a pop quiz. I hope at some point in time in the near future, all of us will have our integrity so tested and that we would pass the test and that it would cost us us to do so because in that moment you'll know something about yourself you can't know in any other way in that moment that's when we discover what really guides us by the way this is why we we shouldn't judge people whose shoes we've never walked in because I guarantee you've thought you said I know I have I would never do that I would never do that well you don't know that Somewhere out there, there's a that that you think you would never do. And then all of a sudden, there's a pop quiz. And if you don't do that, you're going to lose out on something. You're going to miss out on something. They won't call you back. You're going to lose them. You won't be able to go to your dream school. They won't say yes. And in that moment, you'll discover if integrity is actually your guide. It's the only way to truly know. So let me ask you again, what guides you? Something is guiding your feet. Something is guiding your decisions. Something is guiding your choices. It's integrity or it's something else. And you don't know if, if integrity is your guide until maintaining it costs you. Now, there's a fascinating word picture buried in this first line, and I want to point it out, then we'll get to the rest of the, the verse. It says this. The integrity of the upright 
guides them. The, the Hebrew word, by the way, Hebrew is the, is the original language that Proverbs and the re, most of the rest of the Old Testament was written in. The Hebrew word for upright is a lot like the English word for it. It simply means to be upright. It literally means to stand up straight, to put your shoulders back, your chin up, and look forward. Versus living your life like this. When you live your life like this, you only are are able to see and respond to what's right in front of you. That's it. And when you're looking at just what's what's right in front of you, it limits your options. It limits your perspective. When you're living like this, it's immediate over important. It's now over later. It's want to over ought to. There's a posture to integrity becoming your guide. The posture is you live upright and you take the long view. You look up and you look out. The person of integrity realizes that later is longer. The person of integrity is upright. They're up, their integrity guides them. They weigh their options and make decisions based on important, not immediate. Based on later, not now. Based on ought to, not I want to. Here's another way to say the same thing. Your posture influences your decisions, and your decisions impact your future. Young people, listen to this. Your posture influences your decisions, and your decisions impact your future. But we already know that, don't we? Because some of our greatest uh, regrets financially, relationally, sexually, occupationally happen because we were living like this. Want to. Her. Him. It. Now. We were focused on the immediate and we buckled under the pressure to compromise. Solomon says the upright are guided by their integrity because they live Upright. They stand upright and they take the long view. So let me ask you again. What's guiding you? Here's another way to ask this question. If I'm quick to abandon my integrity, if I'm, if I'm quick to abandon what I know and feel I ought to do under, the cert, you know, under certain circumstances or with certain people, then what's really guiding me? You should know the answer to that question. And in discovering it, you may discover you're more concerned with looking good than doing what you ought to do, than being a person of integrity. And I pray and hope in that discovering this, it motivates you to address it. And I pray and hope you do because of what's at stake. Here's the second part of this proverb. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful, the crooked, the person whose posture is this, are destroyed by their duplicity. The root of this Hebrew word means to cover with a blanket, to hide, to operate in the dark, to act deceitfully. And that's exactly what those who lack integrity do, and it causes nothing but destruction. Destruction to you, Destruction to your reputation, destruction to your mental and emotional well-being, destruction to your future, destruction to the people, respect people have for you, destruction to, as we talked about last week, your ability to experience the fullness of God's presence in your life. But the consequences of your integrity, your lack of integrity, are never isolated to just you. A failure of integrity impacts and destroys marriages, families, companies, churches, teams. It destroys other people. It destroys our relationships. But you don't need the Bible to know that. Because we've all seen it. And we've all experienced it. What I say next is so important. Specifically in regards to your relationships. Your relationships at home, at school, with your friends, with each other, at work. Every relationship in your marriage is so important. Integrity, doing the right thing you know and you feel you ought to do, is essential for relational health. 
Have you ever tried to have a healthy relationship with someone who lacks integrity? You ever tried? Is it even possible to have a healthy relationship with someone who lacks integrity? When it comes to a, rela- when it comes to a relationship, there's a, there's a sense in which integrity is like the oil in the engine. Now, an engine, as anyone would know, like, has numerous moving parts in that engine. All these parts were created and designed to work perfectly together. But apart from the lubricant, apart from the oil, they will eventually destroy one another because they build friction as they work. The same is true relationally. Apart from integrity, a relationship will be destroyed because proximity creates the potential for friction, which increases the demand for integrity. This is an inescapable reality that should be front and center with us every single day. Listen, if you're single, your looks, your money, your humor may win him or may win her over, but it's your integrity that determines the health, the quality, and the longevity of your relationship. Falling in love, by the way, falling in love is so easy to do. It only requires a, it only requires a pulse. That's all it requires. I don't know where your mind was, but that's all it requires is a pulse to fall in love. But one of the things required to stay in love is integrity. Listen, a lack of integrity will eventually destroy us, destroy the people around us, destroy the health and the quality of our relationships. And we know this. We know this. Yet the pressure to compromise our integrity is relentless. There's a way to maintain your integrity. By doing what you ought to do when you feel the external or internal pressure to compromise. And the way forward is to decide to embrace this North Star idea. And here it all is one more time. The integrity of the upright guides them and their feet and their decisions. But the unfaithful. are destroyed by their duplicity. Eventually, compromising their integrity catches up with them. Eventually, there's a price to pay because they wouldn't straighten up and take the long look because they were focused on immediate versus important. Now over later. Want to over ought to. They refuse to take into account the harm that they would do to themselves and the people around them. So they did, did themselves harm and they did harm to the people around them. Now, I'm not going to insult your intelligence by asking what type of person you want to be. Because we all want to be people of integrity. So here's the question again. What guides you? Something is guiding your feet, your decisions, your choices. Something is your North Star. So what is it? Is it doing the right thing you know and you feel you ought to do? Or is it want to? Pleasure. Money. Looking good. Reputation. Security. Him. Her. Immediate gratification. Greed, lust, or is it something else? To become a person of integrity and to maintain your integrity, you must first recognize what's guiding you. There's too much at stake not to recognize it. So I strongly encourage you to straighten up, put your shoulders back, chin up, and honestly ask yourself this week and recognize this week what's guiding me. Until you're honest about it, you will never be a person of integrity. You may want to be But if something else is guiding you, you won't be. And not being will eventually destroy you and the people around you. Listen, if you want to be a person of integrity, if you do this, and you want to be a person of integrity, but you recognize that something else other than integrity is guiding you, at that point, don't do what you ought not to do. Don't do what people of integrity, who lack integrity, do. 
don't lie, don't defend, don't make excuses, don't place blame, and try to, to try to preserve an image that you have integrity. You'll just destroy people's trust and respect in you. Instead, do what people of integrity do and take extreme ownership. Instead of casting blame, making excuses, trying to cover up, take extreme ownership of what's guiding you. Take extreme ownership of the choices you've made because of it. Take extreme ownership of the mess that your choices has caused with them and caused with you and just come clean about it. Once again, this is so important when it comes to relationships. The health of your relationships is contingent on your integrity, not on your infallibility. The health of your relationships with your kids, your spouse, your coworkers, your friends, each other, your boss, and the respect people have for you is not contingent upon you being perfect. It's not contingent upon you being flawless. It's not contingent upon you being sinless. It's contingent on when you don't do what you ought to do, not covering it up and lying and hiding and blaming and making excuses. It's contingent upon your integrity at that moment, doing what you ought to do and taking a extreme ownership in it. That's the oil in the engine. This is what I tell my staff all all the time. My staff are not perfect people. I'm not a perfect people. You at work are not a perfect person. And I mess up, you mess up. My staff messes up and they miss deadlines and they don't do what they're getting paid to do. And you know, they don't come through and they totally screw up. And I tell them all the time, when that happens, come tell me before I find out about it. When that happens, don't blame, don't make excuses, don't hide, come and tell me about it immediately. When they screw up and they miss a deadline and they drop the ball and they didn't do what they were getting paid to do and they come tell me about it first, it doesn't destroy my respect in them. It actually builds my trust in them, which is so important because as trust goes, so goes the relationship. And some of you are going, Ronnie, you don't understand. If I take extreme ownership, it could cost me my reputation, my job, that friendship, that promotion, my marriage, that starting position on the team, getting into that college, a scholarship, a lot of money, and it might, it might cost you those things. But you say that you're a person of integrity. However, you don't know if integrity guides you until maintaining it costs you. So shoulders back, chin up, straighten up by recognizing what's guiding you, taking extreme ownership of it, And then doing what you ought to today. Do the right thing you know and you feel you ought to do. Not later, not tomorrow, not when you graduate high school and when you get older and when you have more money in the bank, but today. Listen, you won't magically become a person of integrity later. The when-then game that we play all the time, ooh, when I have more money, when I get a job, when I get married, when I get out of high school, when I get a promotion. That when-then game we play all the, all the time, it don't work with integrity. To be a person of integrity later, we must choose to be guided by integrity now because integrity is like a muscle. And I know a lot about muscles, It grows and it becomes stronger when you use it, when you work it out. The more you exercise integrity, the longer you exercise integrity, the stronger it gets and the more guided by it you become. So exercise your integrity muscle now by doing what you ought to do today. Listen, single people, I'm going to just real quick talk to single, particularly those of you who are in middle school, high school, college. Here's what I'm saying to you right now. And all the married people, as soon as I say it, whatever you do when you, like, really agree with something, you go, "Mm mm-hmm, you know, mm, you know, like right now you're going to give a mm, you're going to know this, okay? But you don't have to do that because you're already, all right, single people, if you're not married, when you hear or catch yourself thinking, when I get married, mm, when you get married, you know the only thing that's different about you? You're married. That's it. I thought, when I get married, I will not struggle with pornography anymore. You know the only difference between when I was before I was married and after I was married? I was married. That was it. Listen, young people, single people, this ain't a magic ring, Frodo. It don't come with superpowers. This thing don't make you powerful. Listen to me. Listen to me. 
It just makes you accountable. Getting married doesn't magically make you a person of integrity. It just makes you accountable to be a person of integrity. So I think you should probably start exercising your integrity muscle right now. The people who do are the ones who can do after they vow, I do. They're the ones who choose to walk upright and opt for ought to over want to. Opt for later over now. Opt for important over immediate. So come on, straighten up, look out. You'll expect the person you marry to be a person of integrity, and they're going to expect the same thing from you. So start doing the right thing you know you ought to do now, and you have a much better chance of being a person of integrity later. But for all of us, regardless of the stage we're life we're in, we need to remember our posture influences our decisions, and our decisions today impact our future, impacts them, and impacts the health of our relationship. So let me ask one final time. What guides you? Recognize it. Take extreme ownership of it. And do what you ought to today. And if you feel pressure to compromise, remember, you don't know if integrity guides you until maintaining it costs you. The lack of integrity will eventually destroy you and the people around you. But those who are guided by integrity, those who are guided by integrity, if you're guided by integrity, you, those closest to you, your relationships will benefit greatly. Integrity is the resolve and the courage to do the right thing you know and you feel you ought to do, especially when it costs you. And when it costs you is when you'll know that integrity is really and truly your guide. We pray. Dear Lord, I just pray that we just don't miss over this, that we choose to go upright, take the long view, be guided by what you are leading us, the ought to's that you have put on our hearts and put on our minds. I pray that we choose to be people of integrity today. And through that, through that choice, I pray that you transform us more into actually being people of integrity. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.